Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bioprocess International's Late Stage Bioprocessing and Cell and Gene Therapy Viral Vectors Digital Week, brought to you by the organizers of the Global Bioprocess International Conference and Exhibition Series. My name is Barry Walsh, and I'll be your host for today's session titled Optimization of the AAV Expression Using Dedicated HPLC Systems. First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping items. If you experience difficulties with audio or advancing slides, refresh your screen with F5. If you are experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, submit your questions into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you receive a link to watch the recording of the session. You can also download a few featured white papers in the resource list box on the right side of your screen. Now let's begin by introducing our speaker on behalf of BIA Separation. Dr. Ivana Petrovic Koshmak, who is the head of upstream process development at BIA Separation. Thank you for joining us today, Ivana. I'll hand it over to you to begin the presentation. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. So uh, hello to everybody who are following. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ivana, and today I will present to you our approach in optimization of AV bioprocess using an HPLC system. So in other words, I will show you all the different ways in which you can use an HPLC system to analyze complex samples. So briefly, uh, I will start by uh, introducing you to uh, our company, Bio Separations, which has now joined uh, Sertorius family. I will share with you who we are and what we do, and then we'll go through different steps of process optimization, including plasma DNA analytics, analytical background coming from cells and media, and then we will move to the orthogonal methods for analyzing complex samples and uh, obtaining information on uh, empty and full particles uh, early in your uh, upstream process development. So a little bit about our company. So uh, in BS separations, we are actually uh, experts for uh, chromatography purification. We are exclusive producer of convective interaction media, which are monolithic uh, chromatographic columns uh, used for purification of biomacromolecules. We have more than 20 years of experience, and at the moment we employ over 160 experts. And uh, our uh, expertise is applied mostly to gene therapy and vaccine market. Uh, we have been recently purchased by Sartorius, and now we are becoming Sartorius Center of Excellence for Gene Therapy. Uh, our uh, downstream products, as well as uh, process development, has been successfully applied to uh, multiple large molecules, including AV, adenovirus, flu, uh, as well as messenger RNA, plasma DNA, and others. We have a dedicated state-of-art facility for manufacturing uh, R&D, and as mentioned before, uh, we do uh, process development activities. Uh, so uh, we can now continue a little bit on uh, our products. So we are actually experts in downstream process development. So besides producing columns and developing uh, purification procedures, we also develop and offer uh, different analytical methods based on monolithic columns as well. Uh, our products are uh, placed in the field, as I mentioned, on plasma DNA, mRNA, uh, we also have experience with mini circle DNA, uh, different viruses, including AV, adenovirus, flu, and others, including those that can be applied on um, SARS-CoV-2 field. We worked uh, for many, many years with uh, different serotypes of influenza virus. We have experience with vaccinia, but we have also worked with the uh, immunoglobulins, 
including uh, intravenous immunoglobulin uh, used for uh, therapy treatment for patients that have antibody deficiencies, IgM, and many others. We have over uh, 30 processes, CGMP downstream processes, that we tech transferred to different clients and CMOs, and these include uh, PDNA as well as, well as viral vector uh, downstream processes. Going back to uh, our agenda, so today I'm going to present to you all the different ways in which you can use an HPLC system for uh, analytical development throughout your whole bio process. We will mostly focus on upstream as the group which uh, I'm leading focuses on uh, upstream process development uh, to complement our downstream knowledge. So we will look a little bit uh, on uh, quality control of PDNA used for transfection. Then I will show you how we did recording of background uh, of media, feed, and cells used in our upstream setup. And then I will present to you uh, orthogonal methods that you can use uh, to track your total AB as well as empty and full AB particles, both in your upstream and early in your downstream setup. So uh, I will be speaking mostly about PathFix switch HPLC. Uh, and uh, we will be using uh, columns of different chemistries, which you can see available on this slide. So let's get started. The first topic to cover is uh, PDNA analytics. So when you are setting up your upstream process development, you are early in your AV production. Most of the processes actually are composed of a triple transfection, some of them double transfection of plasma DNA into uh, either adherent or suspension cells. So one of the first things to check is your plasmid DNA. So uh, as we know from literature, high transfection efficiency is achieved with pure and highly supercoiled DNA. The reasons for these are several. So first thing is that if your DNA is containing endotoxins and if it's not pure, uh, it can actually uh, reduce um, the uh, efficiency of your transfection uh, by uh, intoxicating cells. And uh, supercoiled DNA is known to be more resistant on endonucleases and exonucleases present in cells, and thus it is more likely to reach nucleus and uh, allow you to produce desired AV. So what we see on this slide here is uh, one example so one chromatogram uh, showing HPLC analytics of plasmid DNA. So this plasmid DNA was uh, purified by one of our uh, departments uh, and uh, they used uh, Simultus uh, DEAE and C4 columns. Uh, for this particular experiment, we were not interested to purify supercoiled plasma DNA only. We just wanted to purify total without any specific requirements. So this is how it looks after the purification. On the left side, you can see a peak belonging to the open circular plasma DNA, and the peak on the right corresponds to the supercoiled DNA. According to this analytics, uh, we saw that we have over 80% of supercoiled uh, form. We have uh, measured the concentration uh, we have measured the 260 to 80 ratio, which for DNA should be around 1.8. And as well, we have monitored our endotoxins, which, as I mentioned before, it is crucial to uh, keep a track on uh, in order to uh, achieve good results with your AV uh, upstream setup. On the right side here, you are able to see uh, agarose gel electrophoresis, which we used as an orthogonal method to confirm the OCSC ratio, which we uh, observed in this analytical procedure. So all of the three plasmids, which we used uh, for uh, our transfection, were analyzed in the same way. 
and all three of them had the percent of supercoiled DNA above 75, 80, even uh, 90 percent, depending on plasmid. This is just an example of uh, how you can use an HPLC system. You can further, of course, optimize and uh, decide to test, for example, only open circular or only supercoiled DNA in your transfection experiments and see which one works better for your application. Next thing that we used an HPLC system for was to control our background. As I mentioned, uh, the team that I'm leading is developing an upstream process development. Uh, our approach is probably slightly different from what you would usually see in terms that as downstream experts, we started developing our upstream to be a good input for downstream. What that means is that we are not necessarily uh, favorizing high titers. Because if with that high titer, we are going to bring a lot of impurities that will significantly reduce the yield of the overall process, then this is not really desired. What we strive to create is a scalable process, uh, which is uh, relatively easy to purify in downstream so that all of the full AV that you are able to produce in your upstream is being efficiently purified in downstream. So in order to achieve our goal, we have decided to check for our background. What you see on this slide are uh, different chromatograms that we uh, created uh, by testing different backgrounds of our samples uh, using a CMAC adeno column. So this column is uh, actually an anion exchange, so the kind of column that you would use to uh, differentiate between empty and full particles. And we just wanted to see what kind of profile are our media feed and cells bringing before we introduce an AAV uh, virus in this system. So what we did is uh, we seeded uh, HEC293 cells in suspension in different density, and then we collected these samples after four days in culture. We lysed them, of course filtered, and then we analyzed them uh, using an HPLC system. So what you are able to see on the graphs uh, here on the, the right, first, you can see the media background. Uh, here you have a legend uh, that explains uh, the different colors you can see on the graph. So the first thing that we notice is this peak on the left, which is present in all of the samples. And this peak is actually coming from our media. So it is considered to be a media background. And then in second, third, and uh, fourth graph, uh, we see the output when using different concentration of cells at the moment of seeding. So the concentrations we used were 0, 03, 0, 05, and 1E6. So under these concentrations, what we see is the response of the multi-angle light scattering signal here, here, and here. So we see that the uh, light scattering signal is growing with an increased uh, concentration of cells. Another interesting peak is this one which uh, is actually responding to the picogreen staining. So the green line, which you see on these three graphs, corresponds to picogreen. In other words, it corresponds to DNA load. So we see that there is no such peak in media, while the peak starts showing once when we add cells. Of course, the highest peak is seen with the highest concentration of cells, but then we do not see such a big difference with 0, 03 and 0, 05 E6 uh, cells per milliliter at the inoculation point. One of the reasons why we don't see such a big difference is uh, because, as I mentioned, this is an anion exchange and DNA binds to it very strongly. It could be that the DNA is not being eluted uh, during this uh, salt gradient and instead ends up permanently bound to column until we introduce cleaning in place, which is this peak here. 
So uh, once when we introduce very harsh conditions, such as sodium hydroxide and very high salt concentration, this DNA, including with other protein impurities, gets eluted. So it is possible that some DNA coming from cells was only eluting once when we introduce cleaning in place. And uh, once when certain uh, quantity of DNA has been bound to column during the loading, it is possible that the, the rest of DNA was not being able to get uh, the same strength of binding to the column and hence gets eluted during the salt gradient. And this could be the reason why we start seeing the peak here. So this type of analytics in our upstream setup allowed us to see what kind of impurities we could bring with us if we choose to use this media or certain concentration of cells. So uh, one could possibly argue that if you're able to achieve a higher titer of AV without using very high cell density, then it might be a good idea to go down that route because otherwise it might be introducing uh, quite a lot of impurities that can end up challenging for your downstream. So the next topic we're going to discuss is about tracing of your desired product as well as impurities. Uh, if you are already uh, for a longer time in uh, AV field, you are probably familiar uh, with these uh, requirements of the regulatory bodies of uh, reducing the percent of your empty AVs to as lower as possible. So there is an obvious trend of the, this requirement increasing. So in future, we, we are probably going to see less and less empty AV being allowed for gene therapy um, with, uh, a gene, uh, with gene therapy tools. So uh, it is, of course, uh, our desire to remove as much empties as possible, but if you are the one who is developing upstream rather than downstream, then you would probably like to focus on uh, creating a harvest that already contains less empties to begin with. However, these samples, these harvests which you create during your upstream setup, as well as those which you have in your early midstream or downstream, they are rather complex. So the usual methods which are used for analyzing downstream samples, such as ELISA or qPCR, they're rather sensitive to impurities. So complex sample might be rather challenging to analyze. So now let's discuss the orthogonal methods that we can use to analyze complex samples in our upstream as well as early downstream. So most of you is probably coming actually from the monoclonal antibodies field. This field was already very well developed uh, before we uh, started uh, working more with AVs. And there are many things which we learned from monoclonal antibodies that we are now trying to apply to AV field as well. However, there are some substantial differences. So uh, for this purpose, I'm going to show you an example of a Cho harvest, uh, which was used to uh, produce uh, uh, one biosimilar. So on the graph, you are able to see the analytical size exclusion profile. Additionally, bars on this graph uh, are actually uh, host DNA, so host cell DNA, uh, which was uh, measured by DDPCR. And you can also see histone and non-histone uh, proteins, which are detected by ELISA. Please note the different scale for histone and non-histone host cell proteins. So if you would make a size exclusion of a monoclonal antibody harvest, uh, you will see a very huge peak, which belongs to your product. And then you would notice that throughout uh, different parts of the profile, you have a presence of uh, histone proteins as well as DNA and RNA, which are all part of the chromatin. Since the product is present in very high concentration, the product to chromatin ratio is 
such that this type of analytics is very useful. However, this is in monoclonal antibody field, which is already developed to give very high yields. Situation is quite different when we go to AV field. So uh, suddenly, harvests are containing much lower quantities of our desired product, partially because uh, AV is a very complex structure that contains uh, a lot of different proteins as well as genome inside. And it's um, simply its creation within the cell is a lot more complex and requiring and titers are much lower. Now this lower AV concentration compared to the previous product, which I showed you, inflates chromatin to product ratio. And then if you try to make a size exclusion analytical uh, chromatogram, you will not get as much information about your sample. Of course, you are going to be able to see the amount and distribution of DNA. This is probably going to be DNA that is part of the chromatin. Uh, if you use picogreen staining, then if you use the intrinsic tryptophan fluorescence, you will be able to see the amount of protein present in your sample. However, if you would try to track your desired product, which in this case is AV, both empty and full on this size exclusion chromatogram, you will not be able to get uh, much of useful data. So even though having this kind of size exclusion profile can be very uh, interesting for fingerprinting, especially once when you move to downstream, it is not so useful if you want to quantify your AV product. So what is then an alternative approach that we can take? The answer is cation exchange. So uh, normally for AV purification, we would uh, use at least uh, two steps. One is going to be capture, which is done on cation exchange, and then the polishing step, which is done on anion exchange, and it is used to separate uh, empty from full AV. So on these two graphs, you are able to see an example of cation exchange analytics done on our HPLC system using CMAC SO3 column. So this is a filtered harvest in which uh, we have a V8. So on the left graph, you are able to see uh, signals that correspond to UV 260 and 280, as well as multi-angle light scattering. So the key thing here is that the light scattering in this setup allows us to detect our product while reducing the background. And using this mouth signal, we are actually able to estimate relative or in certain cases also the um, absolute concentration of our AV. But we're still not able to distinguish between empty and full. On the right side, you can see an example on how you can supplement this analytics with picogreen staining as well as uh, using the intrinsic activity of tryptophan to get more information about the protein content. So now this is already the type of analytics which allows you to analyze uh, samples generated through your upstream, maybe during your process setup or once when you produce some harvest before you give it to your downstream team to purify. And you can collect many useful information. However, this method gives you only total AV. So, I'm sorry, before we go uh, to this slide, I would like to ask you if you are able to see something unusual on this part of the graph. So I mentioned that this is a profile done on cation exchange column. And don't you wonder what is DNA doing on cation exchange? So how did the DNA bind to this type of column and why is it eluting from this column uh, throughout the salt gradient? So the answer is DNA is negatively charged, that is true, but DNA is present inside of the cells in a form of chromatin. So uh, besides DNA, chromatin is composed of the histone octamer uh, around which DNA is wrapped. So histones are uh, first positively charged because they need to bind DNA around them, but they're also extremely hydrophobic 
So this kind of structure, even though it has the uh, net charge approximately neutral, uh, there are still local charges which will allow it to interact with pretty much anything and everything, uh, whether it is positively or negatively charged. And this is the reason why negatively charged DNA uh, in the form of chromatin is still able to bind uh, cation exchange. This is one of the, the reasons why in AV field, uh, chromatin DNA or host cell DNA is probably one of the worst enemies, much bigger enemy than it is for monoclonal antibody field. And uh, this is why in most of downstream processes, once when you have your harvest and you either proceed with cell lysis or some other methods, you would always need to consider some way of chromatin and host cell DNA removal. So now let's go to some methods that would allow us to analyze complex samples and at the same time get the information about our empty full ratio. So uh, empty AV capsids are also considered to be the kind of impurity that you would like to remove in your downstream. And it is even more useful if you are able to do this kind of analytics during your upstream setup so that you could possibly vary conditions and create a harvest which will contain less empty particles. However, this type of method is also very useful uh, in the very beginning of your downstream once when you're assessing your sample and deciding uh, what route you want to take, which uh, techniques would you like to try, what different steps you would like to incorporate in your downstream. So let's look at some orthogonal methods that would allow us to estimate empty full ratio in complex samples. So this is a novel method that my colleagues have developed for the purpose of our uh, upstream setup. It is called Patfix column switching method. So it is based on a specific configuration of an HPLC system, which accommodates two columns and then switches between them. So the first column is going to be pre-analytical column and it serves for purification of material. And that one is a cation exchange. And then the second column is an anion exchange, which will provide us with the analytics. So in a way, this is a downstream purification and analytics in small. And it will give you an output uh, pretty much comparable to the one that you could expect once when your sample is purified uh, in downstream. So how this method works. First, you would collect your sample. Your sample can uh, rather be uh, media or maybe total harvest, or you want to work with cell pellet. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it is an adherent or suspension, we've tried both. Uh, you would prepare your sample, so if the need be, you would lyse it, and then you would filter it and dilute with uh, the uh, mobile phase A for the first column. From that point on, samples are being inserted in machine, and machine is loading them automatically on the first column. From the first column, uh, it is creating um, a pH gradient, and then the portion of this gradient is automatically by machine redirected to the second column. The output from the second column is the graph, which you can see here on the right side. So the most useful information for our empty full ratio is going to be the light scattering signal, which you see here in purple. But then, uh, since we have uh, other detectors as well, we are able to gain additional information about the protein content, then 260 to 80 ratio and others. So with this method, you could estimate empty full ratio. You could determine the relative titer based on multi-angle light scattering. If you desire to have an absolute titer, you can uh, 
track that one as well. But for that one, you would need a calibration curve pretty much in the same way like you would need for qPCR, for example. And then you can get an additional information from the other detectors. Uh, other two very important things to note here are the limit of detection and the limit of quantification. So uh, in our hands, limit of detection was around E9 capsids, about one E9 or two E9. Now we're speaking about the total capsids, both empty and full together. And you can achieve this number of capsids with using up to five milliliters of sample, because as I mentioned before, you would need uh, to dilute this sample during preparation. When it comes to the limit of quantification, we have defined it as a signal to noise ratio, which is higher than 10. So now I'm going to show you uh, some examples of experiments uh, which uh, we performed and how we used this type of analytics for our upstream setup. So for this experiment, we have combined different transfection reagents with plasmid DNA. We have created complexes and then we added those over the adherent HEC 293 cell line. After 72 hours, we have collected the total harvest, so media and cells together. We analyze them using our PetFix column switch. And to compare, we also used DDPCR analytics, which would allow us to see the quantity of full AVs. So, okay, unfortunately, aha, okay, here is coming. So this is the uh, output from our second analytical column. So what you see here is the elution gradient and plotted on the graph is light scattering signal. Different samples are given in different colors. So on the right side here, you can see peaks that belong to different impurities. And on the left side, you are able to see two peaks one that corresponds to empty AV and the other which corresponds to full AV. Now, right off the bat, you can see that there are these two samples, orange and blue, which contain a full AV as well as the black one, which contains shoulder. All of the other tested samples show the presence of only empty AV. So now let's see how this actually compares to PCR. Important for the quantification is a graph on the right side. So how did we calculate the percent of full? We took the percent of area peak. So we calculated the area peak of full and then calculated in what percent it is um, present compared to empty and full area peaks together. So the gray columns are uh, DDPCR results for different conditions tested. We tested transfection reagents one, two, and three. The conditions for the third one were previously optimized. This is why we have only one condition. So first thing that we see uh, from DDPCR results is that transfection reagents two uh, gave uh, lower titer lower than the other tested transfection reagents and unfortunately was below limit of detection for our PATFIX switch method. Those are the samples here given in green and in red. So the other two samples which show uh, presence of full AV particles are the blue and the orange one which are these two. So we see that they have approximately the same DDPCR titer, uh, which is given in the gray columns. And these uh, purple um, dots, they mark the percent of uh, peak uh, area for full AV. So we see that they have approximately 50% of full AVs, both of them. Unfortunately, the black sample, which we see here that it contains some empty AVs, uh, we can estimate that it also contains certain full AVs, but we were not able to estimate this with significance because it was below the limit of quantification. Otherwise, uh, said this actually means that the signal to noise ratio was not beneficial uh, to do this quantification. 
So this would be, let's say, one of the, the limitations of, uh, of this method. So this is only one of the examples of what kind of uh, conditions you can optimize using uh, path fix column switching. Uh, you can optimize different transfection reagents. You can optimize transfection reagent to DNA ratio. You can optimize the amount of DNA to uh, per million of cells. You can optimize, for example, uh, different cell density if we're speaking about suspension. Uh, you can test many, many different conditions. And uh, now I'm going to show you another example that is, for me personally, one of the, the most interesting things we've done. So for this experiment, we wanted to get a little bit more knowledge about the empty full uh, production kinetics. So what this means is we wanted to follow our AV production throughout the time and see if empty and fulls are growing with the equal speed, do they start being secreted at the same time and so on. So we've chosen one condition of certain transfection reagent, plasma DNA, we transfected our adherent cells as before, but in this case, we collected our samples at different time points and we collected cells and media separately. We lysed our samples and we uh, tested them using our path fix column switching as well as DDPCR. And here are the results that we observe. So, at the time point zero, as expected, we do not see neither empty nor full. At the time point one, we start an empty AVs. Uh, we start to see empty AVs showing in media, which means this is secreted empty AV. At the time point two, we see a peak that corresponds to empty AV still growing, but we also start seeing the presence of full AVs. And finally, at the time point three, we see that the ratio between empty and full remains more or less the same, just both peaks grow at the same time. This was at first very interesting results for us because what this would mean for someone setting up an upstream could be to uh, determine the moment when full particles are, are starting to show up in media and simply decide to incorporate a perfusion at this moment. So you would eliminate all of the empty AVs which are secreted in your medium so far and simply uh, start collecting empties and fulls. Like this, in a very, very simple way, you can eliminate certain portion of empties and get a more beneficial empty to full ratio without playing much with other conditions. So this was for secreted AV. When we tested the one which was still staying in cells, so the intracellular AV, we saw the similar trend. So we see also higher percentage of uh, empty compared to full. And this is the time point three, which corresponds here to the blue line on the upper graph. So, how does this compare to our PCR data? So DDPCR, of course, did not detect any AVs at the time point zero. At the time point one, we were approaching E8 vector genomes per milliliter. At the time point two, we were uh, almost close to one E10. And then we see that uh, at the time point three, uh, we do have a certain increase of AV titer, but this increase is not as dramatic as between time points one and two. We also saw that the titer in our cells is higher, but as I mentioned, what we plotted is titer. So it will depend a lot how you dilute your cell pellet before you do lysis. If we diluted our cell pellet in higher volume, we could see, for example, this uh, DDPCR value being much lower. The interesting output of this experiment was that we could, for example, decide if we're doing a larger bioreactor run to test our samples at different time points and then determine where our titer is not growing higher anymore and we are not getting any more 
uh, beneficial uh, ratio between empty and full in our harvest, and we simply decide to harvest at this point instead of that one. What this would allow you is to save the running time of your batch or fed batch or whatever process you're having in your bioreactor. It will allow you to save time. It would reduce the accumulation of your impurities. And overall, it could be a very useful tool that you can use not only for the upstream setup, but you can also use it as a type of control during your bioreactor runs. But as I mentioned, complex samples are complex and they do require um, at least an additional orthogonal method. So in order to be sure that what you see with this analytics is true, it is always good to have another method which you can use to confirm it. Uh, PCR in this case, the DDPCR, has DNA's treatment incorporated in it. So we are only seeing uh, full AVs. So we were searching for other methods to use that can show us both empty and full. And of course, one of the most widely used uh, methods for uh, empty full analytics is of, co of course the ultra centrifuge. So we went one step further. We took the ultra centrifuge and we uh, separated AV material and then we decided to connect this uh, ultra centrifuge uh, vial with our HPLC system detectors. So we have used a needle to pierce uh, through this um, vial uh, to the very bottom of, of it. And then we connected it with HPLC system and we used its pumps to direct the content through different uh, detectors on our system. So this allowed us not only to see empties and fulls, but also to measure 260, 280 ratio, get additional information on protein, possibly also DNA, get mal signal, uh, and this is now something I'm going to show you on the following slide, how it works in practice. This method, by the way, we conveniently named centrifugram because it is combining the ultra centrifuge with chromatograms. So we started from the filtered lysate of AV8 harvest, which was prepared in SF9 cells. So this harvest was prepared uh, through the nuclease treatment and TFF was then uh, purified on a cation exchange. So this was the capture step. And then this capture step was analyzed using two different methods. So the first one is the standard chromatogram, which you can see on the upper graph. And then we did the ultra centrifuge and we used HPLC detectors for our centrifugram. So, on the classical chromatogram, what we see is empty as well as full AV peaks. We have 260 and 280 UV signals, and uh, we have a tryptophan uh, fluorescence. On our centrifugram, first, what we see is much better separation of now full and then empty AV particles, so we are able to do a better peak integration. Moreover, this analytics can be very useful not only to detect empties and fools, but also other possible types of AV capsids. As you probably know, AV can come in full, empty, and also partially full. Uh, there are also different kinds of DNAs besides the desired one, which can end up being packaged, including portions of backbone of your plasmid or maybe some host cell DNA, which unfortunately got packaged in place of your desired payload. So if you would have partially full AVs, they would be seen on this type of analytics. You can also see additional peak here. So this peak would belong to uh, heavy particles, which are on the, the very bottom of the uh, ultra centrifuge run. So this is another method in which you can analyze your samples, your complex samples to access the empty full ratio that you can combine with PathFix column switch. Uh, 
And now let's go finally to conclusions. So what I have shown you today is uh, the use of our PathFix HPLC system combined with different analytical columns and how it can be applied to the wide uh, range of uh, different steps throughout your bio process, including both upstream and certain parts of downstream. So what you can do is uh, do quality control of plasma DNA. You can monitor your AV quantities, impurities. You can also perform uh, certain fingerprinting, which is quite frequently used during downstream to follow your sample as it passes through different purification steps. And you can see which impurities is each step removing and how it is enriching your desired product. Uh, what you can also use uh, HPLC system for is the final uh, release tests for your final, final product that comes at the end of downstream. I have also shown you how you can couple the ultra centrifuge with the different HPLC detectors to gain additional insights on different AV particle populations. And finally, I've shown you our novel PathFix column switching method uh, that can be used for empty full analytics and would allow you to estimate this ratio early in your upstream as well as in your downstream. So what this method can be used for, for example, if you're doing your upstream setup on a shake flask or maybe amber 15 or 250, uh, five milliliter of sample is uh, perfectly enough to do this type of analytics. So from amber 15, for example, you can uh, take certain amount of your sample and then gain some additional knowledge, which otherwise you would only get once when you produce bigger volume for your downstream team to purify. So this can be very, very useful. Uh, special accent today we have put to the orthogonal methods which are suitable for complex samples. So I've shown you the example of the cation exchange analytics for total AV. Uh, we have used uh, DDPCR to track our vector genome or full AVs as a comparison method throughout all of the analytics that we were doing. And finally, uh, if you would like to get more information on MT full ratio, you can use ultra centrifuge, specially combined with HPLC detectors and PathFix valve switch to get more information on your sample. So with this being said, I would like to uh, thank to uh, different departments of BS operations that participated in these experiments, including the DNA and mRNA process development department, then department for process development for viral vectors and vaccines that I'm myself part of, and then the HPLC analytical method development department. I would also like to thank our collaborators uh, from the Medical College of Cornell University, as well as those from University of Nantes in France, uh, ICGB, the Italian component, as well as COBIC, which are our colleagues from Slovenia. On the right side, you can see some of the most recent publications uh, that are covering this topic if you would like to get uh, more information. Thank you all very much for your attention. And if you would like to retrieve this presentation, it will be available on Bioseparations website. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ivana, for an excellent presentation. We've received a few questions already but we'll give the rest of you a moment to enter your questions into the Q&A box to the left of the slide. And before we begin the q and I'll run through some brief announcements. First, I'd like to thank CIA Separation for being a part of our Digital Week. Next, I'd like to mention that we have several BPI Digital Week virtual events and live in-person hybrid events planned for 2022. You may view the full calendar today at bioprocessevents.com. Also, be sure to check out the resources list to the right of your screen where you can download a few featured white papers. Now, to begin the Q&A, our first question we received is, what are the advantages of using PAT6 switch analytics in upstream setups? 
So to answer this first question, uh, one of the main advantages is using very small volumes of sample in order to gain uh, more information which you are not able otherwise to get at this step of your process development. So usually early in your process development, what you could do is uh, measure the total DNA, total protein content. If you're using Ember 15, you're able to record uh, some other parameters as well. But this is uh, very much different and advanced because it offers you to uh, get more information about your sample, so both impurities as well as empty full ratio already at such small scale. So that would, in my opinion, be the, the biggest advantage. Great, thank you. Our next question, what type of samples can be analyzed? Yes, so uh, as I mentioned in presentation, uh, you can use uh, very different, uh, very diverse samples as an input. So depending on what kind of uh, upstream uh, system you're setting up, uh, you can test media, you can test cell lysates, you can test harvests, uh, you can test both adherent and suspension. Maybe if you are designing a perfusion method, you can also, for example, analyze uh, your uh, medium as you are retrieving it or exchanging it. So uh, in all of these type of samples, you are always able to collect it, to lyse it if the need be, and you can analyze all of them using uh, Patfix valve switch. Great. Our next question is, can you elaborate on the use of HPLC analytics during downstream? Yes, of course. So uh, this is uh, even better if you have possibility to connect upstream and downstream uh, by yourself. So as I mentioned here in BS Operations, we are mainly downstream experts and we started developing our upstream just recently. But using this type of HPLC analytics allows us actually to directly connect the analytical methods uh, during upstream as well as downstream optimization. So for example, I could use the same uh, type of HPLC method during my upstream and then keep using the same method as my sample is progressing through different stages of downstream. So in a certain way, this allows you to make a, a fingerprinting, as I mentioned before, so you are able to see uh, which step is able to remove which impurities and if you would like to change something, you are able to compare different steps and always go back to your uh, initial analytics. And you can always uh, make a choice to change your upstream based on the output that you see later in your downstream. It is very easy to go back, change some conditions and then use the same type of analytics to gain the uh, comparable data. Great. Our next question, is this assay available as a kit? If not, do you expect it to be available as a kit? So at the moment, this is not available as kit. So this, um, if we're speaking about uh, PetFix valve switching, it is a special configuration of an HPLC system. Columns which are use, used for this type of analytics are, however, available. You can purchase them separately and you could do some, let's say, less complicated type of analytics. But in order to do valve switch, you would really need this type of system. So to my knowledge, uh, this system is not yet being sold, but I think this question is best answered by our marketing and sales department. Uh, maybe I could reach out later to you and provide you a contact so that you can check with our sales department. Great, thank you. I'm sure the attendee would really appreciate that. Our next question, on slide 22, when you claim that this is faster than AUC, did you run an AUC analysis in parallel with these experiments to determine if that was the case? How did the resolution compare to the AUC results if you did use one? 
Uh, so these experiments are done by my uh, downstream colleagues. So what, let's say, I probably do not know all the details, but I can tell you that the um, ultra centrifuge was run here at bias separations. And uh, for this type of analytics, we uh, run centrifuge for a shorter time. So uh, actually our centrifuge, I think, is not the analytical but preparative one. So we are able to uh, load more material. Uh, from what I understood from my downstream colleagues, and I would need to check with them again to confirm this, uh, they uh, have run the ultra centrifuge for a shorter amount of time. So uh, for this type of analytics, once when you uh, combine it with different detectors, you get very nice separation. So this is why, let's say, the, the method was developed in, in this way. Okay, great. The next question, will partially full AAV be detected on your DDPCR method? That's an excellent question. So uh, for that, we would need to understand uh, what partially full AEV particle actually contains. So uh, if we imagine that DDPCR assay targets either a promoter or, in our case, GFP or CMV or, or whatever you're using, poly A, as a target, you are going to uh, be able to see only copy numbers that contain your target of interest. So if you would, for example, have a truncated AV genome and you use only target which is in your promoter, then you're going to see all AVs which contain that portion of your genome. This is why now in our own uh, upstream setup, we tend to use uh, multiple DDPCR targets. Here on these slides, we show only one of them, but it is always a good idea to uh, run the genome integrity tests and you can do this by uh, design, uh, designing targets at different portions of your AV payload. So this will tell you if you have a truncated genome. However, partially full, full particles could also contain uh, other sequences of DNA. So let's say that we have some reverse packaging occurring, which is a case where um, your DNA starts getting packed starting from an ITR and then instead of going into your gene of insert, it starts packing the backbone of plasmid. So this type of, um, let's say, uh, packaging you could detect if you would design primer pairs close to that ITR into the backbone. Like this, you could measure uh, potentially your uh, reverse packaging. So when it comes finally to the possibility of host cell DNA being packed in your partially full AVs, this is already a lot more um, challenging thing to, to, to test. And uh, basically, if you don't know what target you're searching for, you are not able to use PCR for it. In these cases, it will probably be the best if you could collect this fraction and then uh, perform sequencing. I think this is probably the only way you can find out what is packaged in your partially full AVs. Great. That's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you, Ivana, for a great session. If anyone submitted a question that wasn't addressed fully, keep in mind that the speaker will reach out to you directly. This session was recorded. You'll receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is able for viewing. Before you log off, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your Digital Week experience. And on behalf of Informa Connect Life Sciences, I hope you all have a great day.